outsourcing, what are the advantages and disadvantages of outsourcing? Indian Insurance Regulator also has come out separately in 2017, right, with outsourcing. Which functions can be outsourced? Which functions cannot be outsourced? We will see afterwards. Right? So now we confine ourselves. What do you understand by outsourcing? What are the merits and demerits? Outsourcing is the use of a skilled resource outside the company to handle work that was previously performed by its own employees, otherwise called in-house staff. I repeat, outsourcing is the use of skilled resources outside the company to handle the work that was previously performed by in-house staff. So this outside people generally they have expertise in those functions. Where we outsource our functions, they have expertise. Advantages? External specialists help the company. The external specialist means the functions to whom we have outsourced. Those people will help the company, right? Outsource the company to reduce their time and cost. That is, expense are reduced. It enables, second point, better service. Outsourcing enables better service. Number three, business can be budget for pre-agreed fixed cost for the agreed service. For each service they outsource, they know in advance what will be the price expenses. Number four, outsourced companies they will be able to share their skills and expertise with the existing employees of the company. Because they are specialists, somewhere else we have seen, they are specialists, so they can share their skills. And it provides opportunities for partnerships. Suppose if outsource the company is doing very well and you are able to increase the profits and they are helping you in all the aspects, you may have a partnership with them because you like them, because they are helping you. Point number six, capability increases in developing new products. Capability of the existing company employees, it increases. What it increases? To develop new products. So friends, the seventh point would be when some of the activities which you are performing, your own employees, when you have outsourced, now they have got a lot of time to spare on core businesses, important businesses. That is the seventh point. Right? Because you have outsourced some of the functions. Hitherto your own employees were doing it. Now you have some plenty of time where you can concentrate more important jobs. More important jobs. Now we go for demerits, disadvantages. Always whenever you find advantages or disadvantages, minimum you should know three, maximum five. We may give the list in the book, even 10, 15 also. Minimum you should know three, maximum five. Well, it all depends. You see, for example, what is outsourcing? List the three advantages, three disadvantages, seven marks. Okay. Disadvantages? You will lose control over your business because some of the functions are outsourced. You will lose control on your businesses. 
Number two, there may be an occasion where customers feel service is not up to the mark. After outsourcing, after outsourcing, they feel service, service to customer is reducing. Number three, some confidential information may be leaked to the outsourcers. However best you do it, no? Uh, sometimes you are forced to uh, share confidential information. It will be open to higher costs where competition may be lacking. Fourth point, it will be open to higher costs. Number five, if the service provider, he stops providing service, it would be difficult to find out an alternative provider in the middle of the business. You have given to XYZ company. After six months, no, no, I will not be able to do. Then immediately to find out another service provider, it would be difficult. We are talking about disadvantages of outsourcing. See, these slides are coupled with uh, London based outsourcing, what they are telling. Indian based also are there. Both are when you outsource, uh, outsource. Uh, some much substance should be the same. The same. Except the direction. Uh, the regulator will say definition is something else. Yeah. We will also see that. Yeah. Wherever you are comfortable, both this or regulated outsourcing, you write. Five points you remember. Now let us discuss what are the different insurance companies that are existing in India. What do they perform? What are the different insurance companies doing business in India? All of us very clearly we know life insurance companies. Non-life insurance companies are always called general insurance companies. Number three, Healthcare companies where they sell market only healthcare products and lastly reinsurance companies. These are the four. These are the four yeah, different insurance companies that are working in India. Let us briefly see one or two sentences for each company. The question is explain briefly the different insurance companies working in India. Life insurance companies, general insurance companies, standalone healthcare insurance companies, reinsurance companies. This is the answer. For each one, you write one sentence or two sentences. What exactly they do. Let us see now life insurance companies. They deal with monetary investments, children plans, plans that provide maturity and death benefits. So their main business is selling life insurance products, annuities and pension plans. So when you talk about life insurance companies, in your answer, definitely it should be they sell life insurance, annuities and pension products. Now presently there are 24 life insurance companies in India. 23 are private insurers or joint ventures and one is owned by the government of India. Now we will go to the second type of insurance company, non-life insurance companies, otherwise called general insurance companies. General insurance companies are mainly concerned with the protecting property from many risks and natural acts like theft, fire, lightning, typhoon, flood and earthquakes. There are 34 general insurance companies working in India. The export 
Trade and Guarantee Corporation of India Limited and Aggregate Services Company India Limited, they are owned by government, they are specialized insurers. Third category, reinsurance companies, otherwise called reinsurance. Reinsurance companies sell policies to other companies or other companies will purchase reinsurance from reinsurance company. General Insurance Corporation of India, GIC Re, is state owned. Fourth one, standalone healthcare insurance companies. They exclusively market or sell healthcare insurance products only. There are seven companies transacting healthcare plans. Uh, this is a uh, very briefly the answer. Shall we move on to the next? Yes. List any five stand alone health care companies. Star Health and Allied Insurance Company Limited, Apollo Munich Health Insurance Company Limited, Max Bupa Health Insurance Company Limited, Religare, he also should be in red highlighted, Healthcare Insurance Company Limited, Signa TTK, Aditya Birla, and last before a new company has come, Reliance Health. These are the seven standalone healthcare insurance companies in India. And you will uh, see from that list all our joint ventures, private companies, private companies. You can note down what I have highlighted. Right? The suffix is the same for all health insurance company, health insurance company, health insurance company. So you remember by the beginning, Saw Health and Alive, Apollo Monix, Max Bupa, Religate, Signa TTK, Aditya Birla, and Relatives. Please note, in your textbook also it is there somewhere else, but you can note down. And the same question is there in your health insurance, health insurance. In health insurance, uh, only six companies have been given. You have to add their derivatives. Length will stop. These are all the state-owned insurers. One is uh, LIC, the other one is GIC, and general insurance companies are six. Life insurance company is only one. Life insurance corporation of India. Reinsurance is one. There is a general insurance corporation. Re, GIC Re. All other six are general insurance companies owned by government. National New India Oriental United and ECGC and AIC, which I have just mentioned earlier. So these are the eight insurance companies completely owned by the government of India. Okay, friends. insurance regulator. Who are the in intermediaries? Friends, you should be very careful. You see the heading, list of the intermediaries. That means these intermediaries, they may sell insurance products or they may do some allied services for insurance companies. Not necessarily all the people, they market products. Are you clear? Those who sell insurance products, they are called distribution channels or the sellers of insurance products. These are all called intermediaries. Those have some say about insurance. 
or in some of the books uh, you find point of sale may not be there. This is the last one. So if it is not there, you add point of sale. P O S. Agents, that is individual agents. Popularly called tied agents means they work for maximum three companies. Corporate agents, any corporate can take a synergy is developed between that and insurance company. Very popular corporate agent is bank assurance. Brokers, surveyors, otherwise called loss assessors. Survey is the other name of loss assessors. Third party administrators only for health services, PPAs. Web aggregators, insurance repositories, earlier there were five, now it's four. Insurance marketing form, IMF. Insurance services by common service centers, ISCSC. And last before here, point of sale. Capital P, small o, capital S. Point of sale. So these are the 10 intermediaries as per the IRDA, I, Insurance Regulator. For all these things, separate regulations have been issued by the regulator. Right? Next, we will see. What are the main differences between agents and brokers? Main differences between agents and brokers. Now let us see agents first. Agents are the primary channel for distribution of insurance. Large number of policies are sold by individual agents. The public and private sector insurance companies have their branches in almost all parts of the country and they have attracted local people to become their agents. Today's insurance agent has to know which product will appeal to the customer and also know his competitor's products to be an effective salesman who can sell his company the product and himself to the customer. To the average customer, every new company is the same. Perceptions about the public sector companies are also commented in its mind. So an insurance agent can play an important role to create a good image of the company. difference between agent and broker. An insurance broker is an individual or a form whose full-time occupation is arranging of insurance with insurance companies. Insurance broker have high standard of expertise. Broker shall place the interest of their client before all the considerations. Client can obtain independent advice on a wide range of insurance matters. Suffice if you remember these four points about brokers. Very important point is, he is a whole timer. When compared to agent, he possesses more knowledge about the products. He has got some expertise, specially trained. And he sells the products to the customers depending on the requirements of the customer and the products from different companies it will be placed before the customer. Customer can choose, I want this policy from this company, I want this policy to my wife from this company. Like that he can choose. Then he will receive the brokerage from that insurance company. IRDA has issued regulations. There are three types of brokers in India. Direct broker, reinsurance broker, and composite broker.
And sometime back we discussed outsourcing. There are separate regulations. This also has been provided in your material. Here also advantages are there. You see, 16 advantages are there. Earlier we discussed about seven advantages. Right now. So whatever I recommend, minimum at least five advantages you should know. Either there or here. Anything, right? Advantages are the same. They cannot be something else. Disadvantages here, there are seven. Earlier also we are having about six. So friends, this is the IRDAI Outsourcing of Activities by Indian Insurers Regulation 2017. This is the latest regulation in 2017, effective from 20th April 2017, issued by the insurance regulator on outsourcing. see one, one important point which are the activities prohibited by the regulator from outsourcing well this topic we'll discuss here which are the activities cannot be outsourced prohibited from outsourcing means any company they cannot outsource these following activities so there are eight activities let us see one by one investments it cannot be outsourced fund management in the case of unit policies compliance with aml and kyc anti money laundering aml kyc know your customer product designing and actuarial functions including risk management underwriting and claims functions policy holders grievance and redressal dictionary and appointment of agents and surveys or losses deaths and approving advertisements. These are the eight in this 2017 regulations. Companies banned or they are prohibited to outsource. This has you no know, it there in your material also. No? Yeah. Uh, this is very briefly, we had a discussion about unit 1, right, what all we have discussed now, it is unit 1, right. Yes. General Business Corporation of India, GIC Re, is state owned. They exclusively market or sell healthcare insurance products only. There are seven companies transacting healthcare plans. Uh, this is a very briefly the answer. Shall we move on to the next? Yes. List any five stand alone health care companies. Star Health and Allied Insurance Company Limited, Apollo Munich Health Insurance Company Limited, Max Bupa Health Insurance Company Limited, Religare, he also should be in red highlighted, Health Care Insurance Company Limited, Signa TTK, Aditya Birla, and last before a new company has come, Reliance Health. These are the seven standalone healthcare insurance companies in India. And you will uh, see from that list all our joint ventures, private companies, private companies. You can note down what I have highlighted. Right? The suffix is the same for all health insurance company, health insurance company, health insurance company. So it is given by the beginning. Sar Health and Alive, Apollo Monix, Max Bupa, Religay, Signa TTK, Aditya Birla, and Relayans. Please note, in your textbook also it is there somewhere else, but you can note down. 
and the same question is there in your health insurance. Health insurance. In health insurance, uh, only six companies have been given. You have to add their derivatives. Let me stop. These are all the state-owned insurance. One is uh, LIC, the other one is GIC, and general insurance companies are six. Life insurance company is only one. Life insurance corporation of India. Reinsurance is one. There is a general insurance corporation. Re, GIC, Re. All other six are general insurance companies owned by government. National New India Oriental United and ECGC and AIC, which I have just mentioned earlier. So these are the eight insurance companies completely owned by the government of India. Okay, friends. insurance regulator. Who are the in intermediaries? Friends, you should be very careful. You see the heading, list of the intermediaries. That means these intermediaries, they may sell insurance products or they may do some allied services for insurance companies. Not necessarily all the people, they market products. Are you clear? Those who sell insurance products, they are called distribution channels or the sellers of insurance products. These are all called intermediaries. Those have some say about insurance. Or in some of the books uh, you find, point of sale may not be there. This is the last one. So if it is not there, you add point of sale, POS. Agents, that is individual agents, popularly called tied agents means they work for maximum three companies. Corporate agents, any corporate can take a synergy is developed between that and insurance company. Very popular corporate agent is bank assurance. Brokers. Surveyors, otherwise called loss assessors. Surveyors, the other name of loss assessors. Third party administrators, only for health services, PPAs. Web aggregators, insurance repositories, Earlier there were five, now it's four. Insurance marketing form, IMF. Insurance services by common service centers, ISCSC. And last before here, point of sale. Capital P, small O, capital S. Point of sale. So these are the ten intermediaries as per the IRDA, I, insurance regulator. For all these things, separate regulations have been issued by the regulator. Right? Next, we will see <coughs> what are the main differences between agents and brokers. Main differences between agents and brokers. Now, let us see agents first. Agents are the primary channel for distribution of insurance. Large number of policies are sold by individual agents. The public and private sector insurance companies have their branches in almost all parts of the country and they have attracted local people to become their agents. Today's insurance agent has to know which product will appeal to the customer and also know his competitor's products to be an effective salesman who 
can sell his company the product and he will sell to the customer. To the average customer, every new company is the same. <coughs> Perceptions about the public sector companies are also commented in its mind. So an insurance agent can play an important role to create a good image of the company. difference between agent and broker. An insurance broker is an individual or a form whose full-time occupation is arranging of insurance with insurance companies. Insurance broker have high standard of expertise. Broker shall place the interest of their client before all the considerations. Client can obtain independent advice on a wide range of insurance matters. Suffice if you remember these four points about brokers. Very important point is, he is a whole timer. When compared to agent, he possesses more knowledge about the products. He has got some expertise, specially trained. And he sells the products to the customers depending on the requirements of the customer. And the products from different companies, it will be placed before the customer. Customer can choose, I want this policy from this company. I want this policy to my wife from this company. Like that he can choose. Then he will receive the brokerage from that insurance company. IRDA has issued regulations. There are three types of brokers in India. Direct broker, reinsurance broker and composite broker. discussed outsourcing, there are separate regulations. This also has been provided in your material. Here also advantages are there. You see, 16 advantages are there. Earlier we discussed about 7 advantages. Right now. So, whatever I recommend, minimum at least 5 advantages you should know. Either there or here. Anything. Right? Advantages are the same. They cannot be something else. Disadvantages here, there are seven. Earlier also we are having about six. So friends, this is the IRDAI Outsourcing of Activities by Indian Insurance Regulation 2017. This is the latest regulation in 2017, effective from 20th April 2017, issued by the insurance regulator on outsourcing. Here we will see one, one important point. Which are the activities prohibited by the regulator from outsourcing? Well, this topic we'll discuss here. Which are the activities cannot be outsourced? Prohibited from outsourcing means any company, they cannot outsource these following activities. So there are eight activities. Let us see one by one. Investments, it cannot be outsourced. Fund management in the case of unit policies, compliance with the AML and KYC, anti-money laundering AML, KYC, know your customer, product designing 
and actuarial functions including risk management, underwriting and claims functions, policyholders grievance and redressal machinery, and appointment of agents and surveyors or law officers and approving advertisements. These are the eight in this 2017 regulations companies banned or they are prohibited to outsource. This has, you know, it's there in your material also. No? Yeah. Uh, this is very briefly, we had a discussion about Unit 1. Right? What all we will discuss now, it is Unit 1, right? Yes. List different types of directors. Number one, executive directors. They are full time employees of the company. They participate in the all administrative matters. Non executive directors. They are part time directors. They may have one of the Committees of the board. Company secretaries. What are the functions of the company secretary? He maintains statutory registers. Statutory means the registers which are compulsory to be maintained by any company as with the Directive of Companies Act 2013. Number two, he gives a notice for the annual general body meeting. He arranges for special and extraordinary resolutions. He ensures the statutory forms are filled promptly. And also minutes for directors meetings and general meetings, he is responsible. And accounts and documents, he keeps for inspection of any members. These are the five statutory registers to be maintained. Register of members, Register of Directors and Secretaries, Register of Directors' Interests in the company, Register of Charges, and Register of Interests in Shares for the public companies. These are the five standard registers to be maintained. Who maintains? Company the company secretary is responsible. It's not very it is, No, no, it is there when you go for Company Act Section 205 or something. We will see that. Generally, these are the senior positions in an insurance company. Other than the CEO, managing directors and chiefs. Chief Risk Officer, CRO, Head of Internal Audit, Underwriting Director, Claims Director, Marketing Director, Head of Human Resources, Head of Information Technology, Strategic Director, Investment Director. But these names, it may change. Functions are the same. Somebody may say Senior Vice President Marketing and somebody may say actually Chief of Marketing like that. of effective internal communication. 
characteristics of effective internal communication. Sometimes you will find this side. Got it? I remember left and right. Accuracy, clarity, relevance, reliability, credibility, timeliness. These are the six important characteristics to ensure that your communication is very effective. What are the roadblocks for effective communication? Roadblocks means barriers. Barriers, barriers means in simple English difficulties in communication. Right? So roadblocks, barriers, difficulties in communication. At least you remember five out of this nine. The problem of size, see you are only 15. I am able to come to closer to you and talk to you. Suppose there is a group of 60 students. The problem of the size. When the size is big gap, reaching is big difficult. That's what we mean, problem of the size. Size of the members. Natural reserve, fear, lack of confidence. This is another thing. No, each member will have. Knowledge is power. They lack knowledge. Language problem. Problem of time. <coughs> Training. Grapevine. It is not W I N E because you are interested in W I N E, you know. <laughs> it is V A N E, grapevine, right? And failure to recognize the need to tell and inability to listen. These are general, like, common problems uh, when the, where the communication is distorted, where the communication is flow. In this, some of you may be interested to know what is grapevine. Because grapes and wine, no? So everybody thinks grape wine, right? No, it's not like that. This form of communication, as well as rumors, grape wine means rumors, gossips they carry, right? No? Can be very damaging and reinforces the need to control communication and to ensure all staff are advised of major developments or changes at the same time. So, friends, very important uh, business of uh, the executives is to communicate down the line. Otherwise, they will be thinking so many things. They will spread rumors. Hey, something is going on. I do not know what will happen tomorrow. So, like that, they will be giving and they will be spreading rumors. So, it is better. It is called corporate communications, popularly called capital C, capital C, corporate communication. And every month or fortnightly, they issue a communication to all the staff members, some four-page letter. That avoids these rumors and gossips. Right? You got now what is great point? Very good. Briefly discuss different styles of management. Styles of management. Section 205, sometime back we were talking about company secretary. Section 205 of the Company Act 2013, it gives what are the functions of the company secretary. It is there in your material also. You see, this is according to the Act now. According to the Company Act, Section 205. Somebody can help uh, where the material is, in which page. It is there, in unit 2.
So this management style is there in the last page or penultimate page. Yes. Right? How many styles are there? Five styles are there, management styles. All of you got it? Yes. Now we will discuss briefly key management personnel. Is it you need to? No, you need to go Okay. Key management personnel. Subsection 51 of section 2 of the Companies Act. Name the key management personnel in relation to a company according to the Companies Act 2013. Name the key manager personnel, KMP popularly called. If at all they give KMP also, you should you know, substitute it for key manager personnel, managerial personnel. Section 51 of the Companies Act 2013. CEO, Chief Executive Officer or MD, Managing Director or a Senior Manager. Number two, the Company Secretary. Number three, the Whole Time Director. Number four, CFO, Chief Financial Officer. And five, any other such officer that may be prescribed by the Act. These are the five. List key managerial personnel according to the Companies Act 2013. Section 51 deals with this. There are five. Now let us discuss what is the role of CFO, role of Chief Financial Officer. Role of Chief Financial Officer. The Companies Act 2013 has prescribed the role of CFO which would entail lot of responsibilities on the CFO of a company under various provisions. So the first point is only introduction for CFO. He has not mentioned any role there. You agree or not? Yes. Now the role starts. CFO is responsible and liable for penalty and or prosecution for non-compliance with the provisions of such as maintenance of books of accounts, preparation and filing of annual accounts, disclosures of financial information in offer document, risk management, internal control. So CFO is responsible for maintenance of books of accounts, preparation and filing of annual returns, disclose of financial in the offer document, risk management, internal control. This is the first responsibility of or the role of CFO. Number two, CFO is mandatorily required to sign all the audited financial statements of the company along with those authorized by the board. This is the second problem. Third one, he is also responsible for providing various inputs for meeting so that the discussions can be enhanced in the board. So these are the three important roles. Though it is stated in the slide 1, 2, 3, 4, point number 1 is only introduction. The role is three points. Are you clear? Yes, This already we discussed. Section 205 deals with the functions of the company secretary. Subsection 1, there is again A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H 
and subsection 2. Management styles, we have seen autocratic, permissive, right, uh, direct or uh, democrat, directive autocrat, permissive democrat, permissive autocrat, or whatever I have given in the last page, whichever is. You are comfortable, you can write it. Now that is very briefly about discussion uh, about uh, unit 2. Now I'll go to unit 3. <coughs> Name the key management personnel in relation to a company according to the Companies Act 2013. Name the key manager personnel, KMP popularly called. If at all they give KMP also, you should you know, substitute it for key manager personnel, managerial personnel. Section 51 of the Companies Act 2013. CEO, Chief Executive Officer, or MD, Managing Director, or a Senior Manager. Number two, the Company Secretary. Number three, the Whole Time Director. Number four, CFO, Chief Financial Officer. And five, any other such officer that may be prescribed by the Act. These are the five. List key managerial personnel according to the Companies Act 2013. Section 51 deals with this. There are five. Now let us discuss what is the role of CFO, role of Chief Financial Officer. Role of Chief Financial Officer. The Companies Act 2013 has prescribed the role of CFO which would entail lot of responsibilities on the CFO of a company under various provisions. So the first point is only introduction for CFO. He has not mentioned any role there. You agree or not? Yes. Now the role starts. CFO is responsible and liable for penalty and or prosecution for non-compliance with the provisions of such as maintenance of books of accounts, preparation and filing of annual accounts, disclosures of financial information in offer document, risk management, internal control. So CFO is responsible for maintenance of books of accounts, preparation and filing of annual returns, disclosure of financial in the offer document, risk management, internal control. This is the first responsibility of or the role of CFO. Number two, CFO is mandatorily required to sign all the audited financial statements of the company along with those authorized by the board. This is the second role. Third one, he is also responsible for providing various inputs for meeting so that the discussions can be enhanced in the board. So these are the three important roles. Though it is stated in the slide 1, 2, 3, 4, point number 1 is only introduction. The role is three points. Are you clear? Yes, This already we discussed. Section 205 deals with the functions of the company secretary. Subsection 1, there is again A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H and subsection 2. Management styles, we have seen autocratic, permissive, right, uh, direct or uh, democrat, directive autocrat, permissive democrat, permissive autocrat or Whatever I have given in the last page, whichever is, you are comfortable, you can write it. Now 
that is very briefly about discussion about uh, unit 2. Now I will go to unit 3. Planning and control, decision making and management information.
right? Competing firms doing the same business. Number three, functional. Covers the assessment of the company's main functions and process and compares them against the same function and process of in other organizations, not necessarily the competitors. Other than the competitors, some of the functions are same. You compare them. That is called functional. <coughs> some idea now? What is benchmarking? What are the three types of benchmarking? Now we'll go to a yeah, vivo, very popular uh, no? control model, management by objectives. Briefly explain key management factors <coughs> for successful achievement of organizational goals. Briefly explain key management factors for successful achievement of organizational goals. Uh, what is the page number? Yes. You got it? All of you got it? Yes. Uh, I think there are only five points only. Yes, five points only. Yeah. Each job is directed towards the same organizational goals. Each manager's job must be focused on the success of the business as a whole, not just one part of it. Number two, each manager's targeted performance must be derived from targets of achievement for the organization as a whole. A manager's results must be measured in terms of their contribution to the business as a whole. Each manager must know what their targets of performance are. A manager's supervisor must know what to demand from the manager and how to judge their performance. Even in your daily life also, in your organizations, any manager has to follow this, right? Do you have some idea now? Yes? Define budgeting and what are all the different types of budgeting? Very important. <laughs> Define budgeting. What are the different types of budgeting? What is the definition? A budget can be defined as a financial or quantitative statement prepared in advance of a specified accounting period, generally for one year. This is the definition, please. A budget can be defined as a financial or quantitative statement prepared in advance. <coughs> See, most of you may be aware because you are all um, in big pivotal positions in your own organization. Suppose we wanted to plan. It is called technically PPB, Planning and Performance Budget for the next year. Generally, your uh, period of uh, the financial year starts from 1st April, ends by 31st March. Three months before next year, they plan what they will do. They are technically called away days. They will not do their own uh, working premises. They go somewhere so that they will be free from their own, seeing only this hall, no? For four days or five days for you. So the away days they go and all the chiefs and all concerned people, they discuss what should be done for the next year. So planning and performance budget, three months minimum in advance. But you may get doubt, so three months in advance means, what is the current year where we are going to budget, where we are going to end up? So they will see the performance first three quarters, first three quarters, and they will see the performance, how it is going on, all the units, and the corporation as a whole, or the company as a whole. Then they will decide if there is shortfall from some of the units, they will discuss there, and they will ensure that they are going to achieve the budget of that year. Then they 
take it as a base, minimum last three years, and then they discuss for the what should be done for the next year. That is called generally the targets. The targets. Right now. So that is why if they say it is prepared in advance. Right? Budget is prepared in advance. During the fourth quarter of the previous year, they discuss the budget and finalize for the next year. So that on 1st April, all the employees, they know what has to be done. Much in advance. Now we will see what all the different types of budgeting. Top down budgeting. Bottom up budgeting, zero based budgeting, rolling budget. In top down and bottom up budgeting, you are also having another two fixed budget and hmm? you got it? Where the man? So in uh, top down and bottom up, again it can be budgeted with two. One is fixed the budget, the other one? Flexible. 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 Fixed or flexible? Flexible. 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 It can be changed. It can be modified. So top down and bottom up again, they are but you can do two. It is fixed, you cannot. It is sacrosanct, you have to do it. The second one is flexible. So there are no six types of budgeting. Hello friends. There are only four types. The first two are again divided into yes, fixed, the permanent or the flexible. Now we'll see very briefly what do you understand by top down? Hello? Top down. And bottom up, I do not know what is the meaning here. Eh? What is top down and what is bottom up? It's all technical. Eh? Okay. So top down means the guidelines for your budgeting emanates from the CEO of the company down the line. Down the line. Say for example, one insurance organization, there is CEO, four managing directors and 25 chiefs. Down the line, again in journal office, there is a journal manager, deputy journal managers and the chiefs, right, and the senior vice presidents, presidents and all, and again at division level, senior division manager, division manager, at the branch level, senior branch manager, branch manager, and then single or operate, no, one man office also is there. So all these are all the down line, everybody informed by the top of the executive, CEO, hello friends, this you have to do next year. You, you cannot say no. That is what is called top down budgeting. Bottom up, reverse of that. So lower cadres, they discuss their unit, what should be done next year. They will send their proposal through their controlling office. Branches will tell to division, division will tell to again the journal, journal again it goes to corporate office. Zero base, as if you do not have any previous experience. Right? No, because you are not done well, on that you cannot predict. And rolling budget means preparing a budget for one year at micro level and macro level for another three years. Only headings. Now we will see one by one. Top down. Some organizations adopt a top down approach to budget setting. The owners or directors decide on the individual plans for each department and functions and these plans are given to the individual managers to implement. That's all, right? You don't have any say, no participatory level of uh, the style of management. Bottom up. Other organizations use a bottom up approach to budget setting. Individual department managers construct their own budget and these are passed on to higher ups. Both top down and bottom up methods can be fixed or flexible. A fixed department, a fixed budget is not changed once. It has been established regardless if any alterations in normal performance in reality. A flexible budget is changed in accordance with the organization's real activity levels over a period of time. Time is only 12 months. Right? Q1 
वन क्यू टू क्यू थ्री क्यू फोर और एच वन एंड एच टू राइट जीरो बेस popularly called zbb all capitals the zbb method relies on managers to justify their expenditure from a fresh standpoint so friends zbb deals with expenditure expenditure you please know that note the point you are not going to plan for all other things the expenditure so previous years expenditure don't take into cognizance because some of these expenditures where you have to where no it may be more also so don't take the previous years whereas other things how many number of policies are there what is the premium income should come what are the new offices to be opened all those things then you have got the budget you go according to the previous minimum 3 years experience but the expenditure wise for some of the things particularly research mission maintenance and legal services these are the three examples for zbb you cannot have any comparison with the previous year it may change very widely research yeah research may know like that so that is what is called zbb as if you do not have any previous experience fresh you do for every year fresh standpoint how have you followed this yes this much you need not write friends you know that no you have to write only two sentences first standpoint on these three particularly about which one expenditure last one rolling budgets rolling budgets are budgets that constantly look forward with a conventional 12 month budget 12 month budget at uh, micro level and micro level is fuller details all fuller details monthly figures might be produced to create a future budget such as from april to march with a 12 month rolling budget as you come to the end of the month a new month is added at for the end of the 12 month period that means current year budget is right? first april 2019 that was march 2020 April 2019. What is the rolling? April 2020. April 2021. Like that, three years ahead. In a macro level. Minor details will not be there. Uh, perhaps uh, the last question in this. What are the reasons for variance? So friends, what do you mean by variance? Sometime back also I told you. What you have planned and what you have achieved. The difference is called variance. Why this variance should come? What are the reasons? So, what is variance? What are the reasons for variance? What is variance or define variance? A variance is the difference between actual and budgeted performance. That's all you have to write. A variance is the difference between actual and budgeted performance. What are the reasons for this variance? Number one, inadequate pricing, higher expenses than planned, random events which are not in your control sometimes, external events. Number four. Your efficiency levels, efficiency levels of the employees as well as the top management. Top management generally it is called KMP, Key Managerial Person. Sometimes back we have seen that five people are there, no? KMP. So we will break for here from. Budget can be two. One is fixed budget, the other one flexible. 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 Fixed or flexible. 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 <laughs> flexible. It can be changed. It can be modified. So top down and the bottom up again. They are budget can be two. It is fixed. You cannot. It is sacred. You have to do it. The second one is flexible. 
So there are no six types of body type. Hello friends. There are only four types. The first two are again divided into yes, fixed, the permanent or the flexible. Now we will see very briefly, what do you understand by top down? Hello? Top down. And bottom up. I do not know what is the meaning here. What is top down and what is bottom up? It's all technical. Huh? Okay. So top down means the guidelines for your budgeting emanates from the CEO of the company down the line. Down the line. Say for example one insurance organization, there is CEO, four managing directors and 25 chiefs. Down the line again in journal office, there is a journal manager, deputy journal managers and chiefs, right? And the senior vice presidents, presidents and all. And again at division level, senior division manager, divisional manager. At the branch level, senior branch manager, branch manager. And then single or operate, no? One man office also is there. So all these are all the down line. Everybody informed by the top of the executive, CEO. Hello friends, this you have to do next year. You, you cannot say no. That is what is called top down budgeting. Bottom up, reverse of that. So lower cadres, they discuss their unit, what should be done next year. They will send their proposal through their controlling office. Branches will tell to division, division will tell to again the journal, journal again it goes to corporate office. Zero base, as if you do not have any previous experience. Right, no, because you are not done well, on that you cannot predict. And rolling budget means preparing a budget for one year at micro level and macro level for another three years. Only headings. Now we will see one by one. Top down. Some organizations adopt a top down approach to budget setting. The owners or directors decide on the individual plans for each department and functions and these plans are given to the individual managers to implement. That's all, right? You don't have any say, no participatory level of uh, the style of management. Bottom up. Other organizations use a bottom up approach to budget setting. Individual department managers construct their own budget and these are passed on to higher ups. Both top down and bottom up methods can be fixed or flexible. The fixed deposit and fixed budget is not changed once. It has been established regardless if any alterations in normal performance in reality. A flexible budget is changed in accordance with the organization's real activity levels over a period of time. Time is only 12 months. Right? Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4 or H1 and H2. Right? Geo base. Popularly called ZBB, all capitals. The ZBB method relies on managers to justify their expenditure from a fresh standpoint. So friends, ZBB deals with expenditure. Expenditure. You please know that, note that point. You are not going to plan for all other things. The expenditure. So previous year's expenditure, don't take into cognizance because some of these expenditures where you have to bear, no, it may be more also. So don't take the previous years. Whereas other things, how many number of policies are to be now, what is the premium income should come, what are the new offices to be opened, all those things. Then you have got the budget, you go according to the previous, minimum three years experience. But the expenditure wise for some of the things, particularly, Research, mission maintenance and legal services. These are the three examples for ZBB. You cannot have any comparison with the previous year. It may change very widely. Research. Yeah, research may know like that. So that is what is called ZBB. As if you do not have any previous experience, fresh you do for every year. Fresh standpoint. All of you have followed this? Yes. This much you need not write friends, you know that, no? You have to write only two sentences. First standpoint and these three. Particularly about which one? Expenditure. Last one, rolling budgets. Rolling 
budgets are budgets that constantly look forward with a conventional 12 month budget 12 month budget at uh, micro level and micro level means fuller details all fuller details monthly figures might be produced to create a future budget such as from april to march with a 12 month rolling budget as you come to the end of the month a new month is added at for the end of the 12 month period that means current year the budget is right? 1st April 2019, 31st March 2020, April 2019, what is the rolling? April 2020, April 2021, like that three years ahead, in a macro level, minor details will not be there. Perhaps uh, the last question in this, what are the reasons for variance? So friends, what do you mean by variance? Sometime back also I told you. What you have planned and what you have achieved. The difference is called variance. Why this variance should come? What are the reasons? So what is variance? What are the reasons for variance? What is variance or define variance? A variance is the difference between actual and budgeted performance. That's all you have to write. A variance is the difference between actual and budgeted performance. What are the reasons for this variance? Number one, inadequate pricing, higher expenses than planned, random events which are not in your control sometimes, external events. Number four, your efficiency levels. Efficiency levels of the employees as well as the top management. Top management generally it is called KMP, Key Managerial Personnel. Sometime back we have seen that. Five people are there, no? KMP. So we will uh, break for tears from that. Hello, hello, hello. Fine, testing one, two, three. Hello, hello. Like uh, Satyam Computers, hmm? you know Ramalinga Raja, the proprietor of that. He shared the dice with Bill Clinton and Chandra Babu Naidu, the visionaries. What happened finally? So, girlfriend, because of this, no transparency and no accountability, right? So, we'll uh, see corporate governance in Unit 4. These are the topics, corporate governance, incorporation of business, statutory reporting requirements, three lines of defense model, record keeping, reporting and data quality. These are the main topics in uh, Unit 4 according to the syllabus. What is corporate governance? Very, very important in this chapter. Corporate governance is commonly referred to as a system by which the organizations are directed and controlled. So, Madam was telling, you know, controlling. Right? It is the process by which the company's objectives are established, achieved and monitored. You see the three words. Objectives are established, comma, achieved and monitored. Corporate governance is also concerned with the relationship and responsibilities between the board, management, shareholders and other relevant stakeholders. Within a legal and regulatory framework, it's a beautiful definition. The definition was uh, given by uh, none other than the insurance regulator, IRDA, very comprehensive. And nothing is left out in this paragraph. You see, it is a process. Company's objectives are established, achieved, and they are monitored. And they deal with the relationship and responsibilities between the board, the management, the shareholders, 
and other stakeholders. Stakeholders include shareholders, but shareholders he has separated because uh, you know, they did not be company. No? Uh, technically, they call it as promoters. Promoters. That's why they are benefited from the stakeholders. Otherwise, stakeholders comprise of shareholders also. Now the beautiful sentence, transparency and accountability are the most important elements of good corporate governance. That's why I told these are the two eyes uh, for the corporate governance. So friends, uh, kindly remember this, very very important. And you need not exactly write that, but those key words you just see. Uh, you will appreciate that. So, there is a process first. He established, achieved and monitored. And it governed the relationship and responsibilities between the board, management, shareholders. If something, there is a no, miscomprehension or something between the board, management, shareholders, naturally corporate governance collapses. There should be perfect relationship between these three. Right? Okay. Just like that, I skipped. <laughs> that is all UK scenario where those who appear for CA run an exam. For their UK scenario, also is there. So it is not that just like I skipped it. Now I have come to the Indian scenario corporate governance. So here the Companies Act 2013, 18 of 2013, 29th August 2013, it has come. The guidelines for corporate governance for insurance in India issued by IRDA on 18th May 2016. Data of Protection in India, unfortunately there is no separate act except the IT Act 2000 and complying listing rules that is SEBI, right? Listing rules means capital markets. So these are the topics uh, what I have covered in Indian scenario. We will see some of the important points. <coughs> the here, the 29 chapters, 407 sections and 7 schedules in the Companies Act 2013. company is formed. Section 3 of the Companies Act 2013, how a company is formed. A company may be formed for any lawful purpose by seven or more persons in the case of a public company, two or more persons in the case of a private company, and one person where a company to be formed is to be one person only. Earlier, some of you would have known uh, the BCOM and the uh, BBM, sole trader, we used to call them. Uh, so, one man company. So, there are three types of companies public company, private company, one person company. Right? Seven or more persons, public company, two or more persons, private company, one person, one person company.
second important uh, topic in this chapter is how a company is incorporated. How a company is incorporated according to section 7 of the Companies Act 2013. They shall be filed with the registrar within whose jurisdiction the registered office of a company he is proposed to be situated the following documents and information for registration namely number one memorandum of association number two articles of association number three a declaration by an advocate number four an affidavit from all the subscribers number five addresses of all subscribers for correspondence number seven particulars of name including surname family name and particulars of the persons mentioned in the articles particulars of interest of the persons mentioned in the articles the register on the basis of all the documents and information filed under subsection 1 shall be registered documents and information. On and from the date mentioned in the certificate subsection 2, the registrar shall not allow to the company a corporate identity number, shall maintain and preserve as registered office. Furnishes any false or incorrect, they are liable for punishment under section 447. So these are the five important points. But for our purpose, what you should remember is subsection 1, there are A, B, C, D, E, F, G. That means 1, 4, 5, 7 points. These 7 points, once again, I will, these are all the documents. Right? to be submitted to the restore of the companies. Right now, restore of companies, there are seven. <laughs> we have write precisely that. One, I told you, I will repeat again. Memorandum of Association. Two, Articles of Association. Three, a declaration in the prescribed form by an advocate. Advocates include child accountant, cost accountant and company secretary. Four, affidavit from each of the subscribers. Five, address for co correspondence. Six, particulars of names, including family name, residential address, etc. Next, particulars of persons mentioned in the articles. And the last one, particulars of the interest of the persons mentioned in the articles. That's all. Don't write all, you know. So earlier it is written a lot of uh, no, information is given. Here succinctly 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Same thing which I have repeated now. So without any elaboration, only points have come. See, MOA, AOA, declaration, affidavit, address, details of subscribers, first directors, interest of the first directors. Okay. That is the next important uh, topic, right? Which are they? Number one, audit committee. 
So among these committees, friend CME, there are uh, mandatory committees. That means compulsorily every insurance company they must have. And there are some optional committees. They may have, they may not have. Right? So let us see that mandatory committees. Mandatory committees. Number one is audit committee. What is 
the role of an appointed actuary. Always we call capital A, capital A. Appointed actuary. A, A stands for appointed actuary. All the life insurance companies, compulsory, they must have one appointed actuary. General insurance company, they must have two appointed actuaries. What do they do? It's a very pivotal position they all hold. Very pivotal, very important position. Broadly, these are the eight roles they play. Estimation of technical provisions in accordance with the valuation framework set up by the insurance company. Identification, estimation of material risk and appropriate management of the risks. And financial condition testing, solvency margin requirements, appropriateness of premiums and surrender values, allocation of bonuses to with profit insurance contracts, just as I told you. And management of participating funds and product design, risk mitigation and other related risk management roles. These are the important functions of the appointed actuary. Among these uh, eight functions, very first function is product design. Then fixing the price. which I would like to talk to you about the unit 4 is whistle blowing policy. Whistle. How many of you can put whistles? No, 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 it will be cut in that. So it is not uh, blowing a whistle, right? Everybody will be like this, ready, whistle blows, then they run, no? Huh? Right. What do you understand by whistle blowing policy of a company? Insurers are well advised to put in place a whistle blower policy whereby mechanisms exist for employees to raise keywords. Mechanisms exist for employees. What for? To raise concerns. Hello, gentlemen, you are not doing well. Result going. By whom? The lowest employee. Right, no? That's great, no? That is what is called result growing policy. About what is the result growing? Possible irregularities, governance weaknesses, financial reporting issues, or any such matters. So, any employees of the company, they can bring to the notice of higher ups. These are all the, some of the things are not okay. You please rectify. These could include the employee report in confidence directly to the chairman of the board or a committee of the board or to the statutory auditor. Yeah, this is what is called a whistle blowing policy. So, somebody has uh, blown the whistle, finish. And next thing you will not get promotion. All those things also happen, no? But I still need enforcers that is not like Yeah, but for that precautions are here. The whistle blowing policy illustratively covers the following aspects. Uh, so the probable uh, no, important uh, when you frame the question is what do you understand by whistle blowing policy and what it covers? Awareness of the employee that such channels are available. First employee should know they can blow the whistle. Right, no? Number two, handling of the reports received confidentially for independent assessment, investigation and where necessary for taking appropriate follow-up actions by the management. Number three, a robust anti-retaliation policy. You should not let, oh, you fellow, you have done like this. So there must be a policy, if somebody blows the whistle, right, it is for the betterment of the company. So he should not be punished. That's why anti-retaliation policy to protect the employees who make reports in good faith. And lastly, briefing of the board of directors. Hello, directors, we are having this policy.
that section is borrowed from IT Act 2000 because we don't have production of data. Uh, in 2006 itself, it was slated before Rajya Sabha and it has not seen the day.
CSR committee also only for insurance, earning profits. With profits committee only for life insurance. So these are the seven mandatory committees which assist the board of directors. With profits committee. With, with profits. I told you with profit means in life insurance there are several products. Some of the products they participate in the surplus declared by the company. That's why you would have seen uh, somewhere in the month of September the life insurance company they declared bonus. For every product, no, for thousand some much, this much 25 rupees or 30 rupees. So they, those plans only will get that bonus. It is attached every year to that bonus. They are called with profit plans. So wherever in the life insurance companies with profit plans are there, that is the seventh mandatory committee. For life insurance only, within brackets you write that. Audit committee, mandatory. Invest committee, mandatory. Risk management committee, mandatory. Policy holders protection committee, mandatory. Mandatory means compulsory. Nomination and remuneration committee, compulsory, mandatory. Corporate social responsibility committee, CSR committee, mandatory, only for people, five crores and more the business, net profit of the previous years. With profit committee, it is only for life insurance, it is mandatory. Those are the seven committees mandatory. Other committees are Ethic Committee, ALM Committee, Asset Liability Management, and what is the role of an appointed actuary? Always we call capital A, capital A. Appointed actually. A A stands for appointed actually. All the life insurance companies compulsory they must have one appointed actually. General insurance company they must have two appointed actuaries. What do they do? It's a very pivotal position they all hold. Very pivotal, very important position. Broadly, these are the eight roles they play. Estimation of technical provisions in accordance with the valuation framework set up by the insurance company. Identification and estimation of material risk and appropriate management of the risks. And financial condition testing, solvency margin requirements, appropriateness of premiums and surrender values, allocation of bonuses to with profit insurance contracts, just as I told you and management of participating funds and product design, risk mitigation and other related risk management roles. These are the important functions of the appointed actually. Among these eight functions, very first function is product design. Then fixing the price. Policy 
whereby mechanisms exist for employees to raise keywords. Mechanisms exist for employees. What for? To raise concerns. Hello, gentlemen, you are not doing well. Result going. By whom? The lowest employee. Like, huh? That's great, no? That is what is called whistle blowing policy. About what is the whistle blowing? Possible irregularities, governance weaknesses, financial reporting issues, or any such matters. So, any employees of the company, they can bring to the notice of higher ups. These are all the, some of the things are not okay. You please rectify. These could include the employee report in confidence directly to the chairman of the board or a committee of the board or to the statutory auditor. Yeah, this is what is called a whistle blowing policy. So somebody has uh, blown the whistle, finish. And next thing you will not get promotion. All those things also happen, no? But actually in Infosys that is what they have. Yeah, but for that precautions are here. The whistle blowing policy illustratively covers the following aspects. Uh, so the probable uh, no, important uh, when you frame the question is what do you understand by whistle blowing policy and what it covers? Awareness of the employee that such channels are available. First employee should know they can blow the whistle. Right, no? Number two, handling of the reports received confidentially for independent assessment, investigation and where necessary for taking appropriate follow-up actions by the management. Number three, a robust anti-retaliation policy. You should not retire, oh you fellow, you have done like this. So there must be a policy, if somebody blows the whistle, right, it is for the betterment of the company. So you should not be punished, that's why anti-retaliation policy to protect the employees who make reports in good faith. And lastly, briefing of the board of directors. Hello directors, we are having this policy.
list the principal functions and operational functions. These are the eight principal functions. Strategy and planning, underwriting, trains, sales and marketing, actuarial, risk management, investment management, finance and treasury. These are the eight departments which fall under principal functions for our study. For our study. What is the asking? No, my question is list the principal functions and operational functions. That is the question. What is that he wanted to know? No, some sales and marketing. Sales or investment management as an asset management. Hmm. Is it no, whatever it is given in the book, you have to write that only. This is according to your syllabus. This is according to your syllabus. Hmm, okay. Whatever I tell, you do that. And what are all the operational functions? Segmentation, 
development of strategic marketing plans, development of operational marketing plans, advertising, media relations, public relations and sponsorship, product development, relationship management. Relationship management includes sales management and customer service. So when you talk about marketing department, right, that marketing department team's role must compulsorily include these activities. Right? We have followed this, right? Now we'll go to the operational functions. In operational functions, let us discuss human resources and facilities management. Human Resources, popularly called HR. The Human Resources team undertakes a wide range of activities in the resources of staff, ensures the best practice of recruitment, employment, staff development techniques are used. The approach to staff resourcing, development and remuneration is a key element of the corporate strategy and staff costs are usually the second largest overhead for insurance companies after claims. Recruitment. The recruitment process starts with analysis of the type of experience and skills that are required to carry out a particular role or roles to be filled. HR team assists a number of operational management in drawing up a job specification and person profile. It also carries out external research to gain a picture of salaries and benefits being offered to people employed in similar roles in order to set a competitive package and attract candidates. So these are the two slides which give you the uh, introduction for recruitment. <laughs> introduction for recruitment. Right? So there are different types of uh, you know, the designations. So each designation, how many people are required to be recruited, that they will assess first. So your answer should first know, you must have the assessment of vacancies for various cadres of jobs. In your own language you can write, assessment. So that assessment has to be, somebody should approve it. A person authorized in the HR department, he will approve. These are the number of vacancies. You would have seen the advertisement how it is. Yeah. Uh, assistant, so many, and this is the package. Vice President, so many, this is the package. And they also mention what is the salary. And they also, while assessing that, they compare the similar other organizations, what is their package? What are their fringe benefits? Right, no? You would have seen, no, a variable package, as they say. Uh, 12 to 15 lakhs, 12 lakhs fixed set, 3 lakhs variable package, depending on the performance and their profits. All those things are assessed. Now the point is, which are the important points in the recruitment process? There are five stages for recruitment process. They are sign off, recruitment, interview, job offer, induction. So briefly explain the recruitment process of an organization. Under these five heads, you have to explain. Sign off. Sign off means the number of vacancies in various cadres have been assessed and approved. That is what is called sign off. It is not the signature is offer. No, sign up means assessing the number of vacancies in the various quarters and it is approved. That's called sign up. So that to confirm the recruitment has been authorized by a senior manager. Number two, recruitment. Recruitment means how do you go about recruitment? So whether you go directly giving in the, uh, the paper advertisement, all right, or 
you will take the help of a recruitment agency. So that is what is called recruitment. Direct advertisement or recruitment agency or a such company, you will authorize. In addition, companies will frequently use internet-based job sites and social networking sites to advertise the job vacancies. That is what we mean the second stage of recruitment process, that is called recruitment. Interview. Those who have passed the test and all, they will be interviewed. Interviews are arranged and HR often undertakes a pre-selection process. A pre-selection process. Before a short list of candidates is interviewed by the operational manager. It is important that at this stage all legal requirements are adhered to in terms of sex discrimination and ageism and equal opportunities. You know, no? the 10% is reserved for this, 12.5 is reserved for this, right? you have to undergo for medical examination. All these things are done in the interview. Job offer. Now interview is over, medical examination is over, then they will go for offering a job. There is a pre-printed letter, it is signed. And along with the job offer, some company they give, what are their duties and responsibilities. One annexes they give. So when the preferred candidate has been identified, the HR representative makes a job offer. Great care must be taken in this area as it is important to ensure that all the contractual features such as salary, bonuses, pension scheme and other benefits are made abundantly clear. And the last stage of recruitment process, fifth stage is induction. You are inducted into the job. So suppose there are 10 departments, so every one month or two months you are directed to or rotated to all the departments so that you will have know-how of various jobs of that particular company. When we were recruited there was one year training, all over India we have just uh, gone, right now, most of you know that. So director of service, because he doesn't know anything about that company, about that bank, so they are you know, sent to various departments. So you will be paid uh, like a stipend, but actual salary they pay it. That is what is called induction. You are inducted to know the various uh, jobs of uh, the different departments. When a new member of staff joins the firm or the company, HR team arranges an induction program on all administrative matters. Very, very important sentence. Team arranges an induction program on all administrative matters. Various departments. I have listed 21 departments in the beginning. Like that, no? So when there is a probationary period, the HR department keeps a diary record to meet with the operational manager ahead of the end of the period to discuss whether the position can be confirmed as a permanent role. So in your departments also it may be there. Conventional reports they say are assessing your performance. And 50% is open, 50% is confidential. They write your confidential report, assess your performance and give it to you. Do you agree? You will go through that. I do not agree these, these points. Then the guy is sent to the confidential report with those who have written. Uh, right? Your promotion and all, it is linked. So afterwards, whatever the comments he has given, he will go through. Afterwards, he will not circulate to you what he has done. These are the two-way process of the confidential reports or assessment of your performance. And most of you know that is your department. We have some idea now what is recruitment process, five stages. So now let us discuss FM. FM means facilities management. <coughs> For example, see, you have been uh, given, you know, uh, I think, uh, six days training here. So what are the facilities they have provided? I, I have provided to you. A room has been provided, lighting has been arranged, seating arrangements properly done. Uh, they are giving you supply of coffee. Uh, they are also giving water and to keep you cool and AC arrangements have been done. These are all the facilities. 
suppose women employees are there, there is a dormitory facility and uh, somebody comes from the training with a little child of three months, then for that also they achieve, but nobody has come so far. If at all they come from, that also has to be arranged. Right? These are all the facilities. A simple example I am quoting. But let us see what is our uh, syllabus, they say. Given that all insurance organizations require a physical location, the role of FM, FM means is not FM radio, hello. Facilities management. T is important, vital, to the smooth running of the business of the company. The role of facilities management includes procurement of an office or other property to meet the accommodation needs. So the very first point comes to your mind, it should be accommodation needs of the company and to achieve this external property agents will be employed to seek the type of property required and advise the form on levels of rent, service charges and local authority rates etc etc. Any special needs such as a dual source of power to reduce the risk of an interruption to operations through a power failure or identified as well as workforce capacity and location. So once the property has been found, accommodation has been found, the fitting out will be completed on this. Facilities for visitors, staff desk and workstations, welfare facilities, IT suit, catering facilities, meeting rooms including boardroom. The FM team is likely to have responsibility for ensuring that the design and construction of the building allows the fitting of full telecommunication facilities. Although the IT department may produce the technical specifications and fitting of this equipment. So this is uh, come to a close of uh, the chapter five. In the recruitment process. There are five stages for recruitment process. They are sign off, recruitment, interview, job offer, induction. So briefly explain the recruitment process of an organization. Under these five heads, you have to explain. Sign off. Sign off means the number of vacancies in various cadres have been assessed and approved. That is what is called sign off. It is not the signature is offer. No, sign off means assessing the number of vacancies in the various cadres and it is approved. That is called sign off. Well, to confirm the recruitment has been authorized by a senior manager. Number two, recruitment. Recruitment means how do you go about recruitment? So whether you go directly giving in the, uh, the paper advertisement, all right, or you will take the help of a recruitment agency. So that is what is called recruitment. Direct advertisement or recruitment agency or a such company, you will authorize. In addition, companies will frequently use internet-based job sites and social networking sites to advertise the job vacancies. That is what we mean the second stage of recruitment process that is called recruitment. Interview. Those who have passed the test and all, they will be interviewed. Interviews are arranged and HR often undertakes a pre-selection process. A pre-selection process. Before a short list of candidates is interviewed, by the operational manager. It is important that at this stage all legal requirements are adhered to in terms of sex discrimination and ageism and equal opportunities. You know, no? the 10 percent is reserved for this, 12.5 is reserved for this, that you have to undergo for medical examination. All these things are done in the interview. Job offer. Now interview is over, medical examination is over, then they will go for offering a job. There is a pre-printed letter, it is signed and along with the job offer, some company they give, what are their duties and responsibilities, what annexes they give. So 
when the preferred candidate has been identified, the HR representative makes a job offer. Great care must be taken in this area as it is important to ensure that all the contractual features such as salary, bonuses, pension scheme and other benefits are made abundantly clear. And the last stage of recruitment process, fifth stage is induction. You are inducted into the job. So suppose there are 10 departments, so every one month or two months you are directed to or rotated to all the departments so that you will have know-how of various jobs of that particular company. When we were recruited there was one year training, all over India we have just gone, right now, most of you know that. So director of service, because he doesn't know anything about that company, about that bank, so they are you know, sent to various departments. So you will be paid like a stipend, but actual salary they pay it. That is what is called induction. You are inducted to know the various jobs of the different departments. When a new member of staff joins the form or the company, HR team arranges an induction program on all administrative matters. Very, very important sentence. Team arranges an induction program on all administrative matters. Various departments. I have listed 21 departments in the beginning. Like that, no? So when there is a probationary period, the HR department keeps a diary record to meet with the operational manager ahead of the end of the period to discuss whether the position can be confirmed as a permanent role. So in your departments also it may be there. Conventional reports they say are assessing your performance. And 50% is open, 50% is confidential. They write to your confidential report, assess your performance and give it to you. Do you agree? You will go through that. I do not agree with these, these points. Then the guy is sent to the confidential report with those who have written. Uh, right? Your promotion is sent all, it is linked. So afterwards, whatever the comments he has given, he will go through. Afterwards, he will not circulate to you what he has done. These are the two-way process of the confidential reports or assessment of your performance. And most of you know that is your department. You have some idea now what is the recruitment process? Five stages. So now let us discuss FM. FM means facilities management. <coughs> For example, see, you have been uh, given, you know, I think, uh, six days training here. So what are the facilities they have provided? I have provided to you. A room has been provided, lighting has been arranged, seating arrangements properly done. Uh, they are giving you supply of coffee. Uh, they are also giving water and to keep you cool and AC arrangements have been done. These are all the facilities. Suppose women employees are there, there is a dormitory facility and uh, somebody comes from the training with a little child of three months. Then for that also they achieve, but nobody has come so far. If at all they come, no? that also has to be arranged. Right? These are all the facilities. A simple example I am quoting. But let us see what is our uh, syllabus they say. Given that all insurance organizations require a physical location, the role of FM, FM means it is not FM radio, hello. <laughs> Facilities management. T is important, vital, to the smooth running of the business of the company. The role of facilities management includes procurement of an office or other property to meet the accommodation needs. So the very first point comes to your mind, it should be accommodation needs of the company and to achieve this external property agents will be employed to seek the type of property required and advise the form on levels of rent, service charges and local authority rates etc etc. Any special needs such as a dual source of power to reduce the risk of an interruption to operations through a power failure or identified as well as workforce capacity and location. So once the property has been found, accommodation has been found, the fitting out will be completed on this. Facilities for visitors, staff desk and workstations, welfare facilities, IT suit, catering facilities, meeting rooms including boardroom. 
the FM team is likely to have responsibility for ensuring that the design and construction of the building allows the fitting of full telecommunication facilities. Although the IT department may produce the technical specifications and fitting of this equipment. So this is a complete close of the, the chapter five. Can anybody tell me what are the accounting principles? How many of you are BCom, MCom, BBM, MBA, and those who are working in accounts department in your organization? And then my job is made very easy. Right now, I can whatever I tell that is fine. <laughs> it's like that. Somebody should check me. <laughs> What are the regulations issued by the Companies Act 2013 on accounting? Let us uh, briefly discuss this. The Companies Act 2013, what are the regulations mentioned in the Companies Act 2013 about accounting? One, requirements to keep adequate accounting records. Two, director's duty to prepare accounts for the company. Director's duty to prepare accounts for a group of companies and the consistency of financial reporting within the group and requirements to prepare accounts and show the true and fair value. Beautiful words. The true and fair value. Friends, uh, almost all of you would have seen in the auditor's report last sentence. To the best of my knowledge, I have audited all the books of accounts. Whatever the clarifications are required, they are provided to me and then it complies with all the statutory requirements. That is how it is written and signed by the auditors. So that is what is called true and fair value, the accounts of the company they reveal. So these are the four points, Companies Act 2013, the regulations on accounting. Accounts have to be published in a format that complies with these regulations and accounting standards requirements. So accounts include the company's financial statements which comprise the following. The second important topic in this chapter, income statement, which shows the results of the company as consequence of transactions during the accounting period. Generally it is uh, now uh, financial year. It sets out income, expenses, taxes and profit or loss. So we are seeing the definitions of the important statements that ought to be prepared by each company at the end of the financial year. Number two, balance sheet. Balance sheet is a statement of financial position of the business at a point of time, at a particular date, the accounting period or the year end of date. It is a snapshot, which is a snapshot? Balance sheet is a snapshot of the company's position at a particular point of time. Friends, earlier we used to prepare balance sheet only at the end of the year. Now balance sheet can be prepared every day. Uh, that is the you know, advantage now. Uh, so what is owned and what is owed? Owned by the company, owed by the company. Now what is owed by the company includes shareholder equity, which is the total assets and liabilities. So, third one is cash flow statement. We are following, you know, what are the important statements that are to be prepared by an insurance company at the end of the financial year, according to the company's act. This is the question. Number three, cash flow statement. So, this includes definitions also now. Cash flow statements are prepared as an integral part of company's financial statement to recognize that accounting profit or loss is not only the indicator of the company's performance. Thus, cash flow statements show the sources and uses of cash, how the cash has been emanated, how the cash has been spent. This is what, uh, no, in the cash flow statement, three types of activities which we will see that. So cash flow statements show the sources of income and the 
items where you have spent the cash. Right? Resources of getting the cash and for the purpose for which you have spent the cash. These two items are covered in the cash flow statement by way of three different activities.
this is the accounting equation assets are equal to equity plus liabilities or equity if you bring it to left side equation comes now assets minus liabilities so whatever you work up in the company that should be equal to this equation which is called accounting equation the equation means that the number of assets must be equal to the combined amount of equity plus liabilities that is what is called accounting equation the formula is assets is equal to equity plus liabilities what is equity equity is the amount to be paid to the shareholders liabilities are the amount which you have borrowed from outside so total if you put together that is what you owe to the company you are clear now about this yes so otherwise the formula can be rewritten like this equity is equal to assets minus liabilities equity is the property of the shareholders here is an example equity is equal to assets minus liabilities i go in pounds you can write with rupees one or two not the entire thing you, you can just give you have started the business with the 2000 rupees just an example so what will happen what is the equity you are having what are the assets you are having 2000 only you have not started any year you have brought 2000 rupees and kept in the bank so that is the equity amount and that is the cash you are having what is your liability no liability hello why hello madam you are killing me no 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 you know you know see i started a business with uh, one core capital today what is my equity because i only started as a shareholder one crore is equity what is the amount i am having one crore is there any liability for me no that is the first equation afterwards i purchase or i spend and equation will change now after the tools are brought he has brought the tools worth of 500 so in the beginning equity was 2000 now he has purchased 500 tools and what is the cash available what is the liability zero after some time what he says and he brought assets on credit in the equity it is 2000 already purchased tools for 500 now he has bought assets for 750 and plus 1500 cash now what is the liability 750 so now equity must be equal to assets minus liabilities tools you have purchased it is an asset and 1500 cash you are having it is also an asset liquid asset we call it but 750 assets you have purchased but you have purchased on credit so it is a liability huh? all of you have followed no? yes so after some time the company's first job right 2000 plus 50 rupees profit they got so your capital is increased now so 2000 plus 50 it is 2050 now this side 500 and you have got cash now 50 rupees increase 1550 750 and liabilities is 750 so the final equation following these transactions continue to balance is equity 2050 is equal to assets 2800 minus liability 750 2050 I think uh, all of you have followed this. Yes. Right? One thing is, instead of pounds, you write rupees. Yes. It is just an example, right? Now, this is very, very, very important when you talk about the balance sheet. Balance sheet contains assets and liabilities, is it not? Like, the financial strength of the company shows the health of the company, right? What is a balance sheet? And explain in detail classification of assets and liabilities contained in the balance sheet. 
Uh, there is a very probable uh, no, question. We call the last. What is a balance sheet? What are the classifying assets and classifying liabilities that are shown in the balance sheet? What is a balance sheet? Already we have seen. A balance sheet is a statement of the net wealth of the business at a particular time. This is the definition for balance sheet. Friends, you just see this sentence. The difference between a business total assets and its total liabilities is called shareholders equity. And it belongs to owners of the business. Agreed or not? Which is otherwise called equity. Okay? Now we will go to the different assets and liabilities. So always assets will be non-current assets, current assets. Liabilities will be current liabilities, non-current liabilities. What all the items fall under these four headings? That is what is called classification of assets and classification of liabilities. Very very important even for the examination. Assets are normally classified into non-current assets and current assets. Non-current assets are the items that are controlled by the business which the company intends to keep for more than one year. Not current, no urgency. It can be kept for quite some time. Generally more than a year. Current assets means within one year you have to replenish. Major categories of non-current assets include goodwill and other intangible assets, property and investments. Uh, you have to study and buy hard this. Right? Classifying assets, non-current assets, current assets. What do you mean by non-current assets? Assets which are kept for more than one year. What are the examples? These three are the examples. Be very clear. Goodwill, property and investments. Goodwill and other intangible assets. Goodwill is the difference between the amount paid for acquiring business and the value of the net assets of that business when acquired. Other intangible assets include patents, brands and licenses. Property. This includes freehold and leasehold property and land used QA, the business for trading. Investments. Investments includes property held for investments rather than used by the business for trading, equities and government bonds, corporate bonds. So there is a brief explanation of this non-current assets. But you should remember what are the non-current assets. Goodwill and other intangible assets, property and investments. Now we go to the current assets. Non-current assets must be for more than one year. Current assets must be within next 12 months. More than 12 months, non-current assets. Current assets within 12 months. These are the items of wealth that the business controls and intends to use within next 12 months. No, indirectly current assets mean which are more liquid assets which are known liquid assets. Within 12 months he is telling means urgently when you need funds, what should be the assets? They are called current assets. So the best liquid asset is cash. Right now, next cash in bank. Or cash in a person or the bank are equivalent to that. Suppose you have got gold leverage also. You can sell it very easily. That also can be you know, liquid in cash. So what are the examples of current assets? Cash and cash equivalence. You see the wording. Cash and cash equivalence. Two, stock. Stock comprises of how many items? Hello, hello, hello. Three, who said? Great, three items. 
that ours. These are the three items included in the current assets. If you need any funds within 12 months, you look at these three items. That ours, you have already given the money. Hello, hello, hello. You have to keep pay me within 12 months. You cannot have more. Now, brief description about this non-current asset. Cash and cash equivalents. This is cash on hand and cash held in the business's bank account, including deposits, held for up to three months from the balance sheet date. Be very clear about this. Cash on hand, cash in bank. If you have got a deposit, it, it can be realized within three months. That means you can take deposits, you can, but for short duration, not for five years. Right? Number two, stock. In most cases, there are three different types of stock owned businesses. The first is raw materials, next is work in progress, and the third is finally the raw finished goods. These are the three components which we call stock. Debtors. Debtors are customers who owe business money. They are created when goods or services are sold on credit. Debtors are considered to be an item of wealth on the balance sheet since the customer owes the money to the business and is expected to pay within a short period of less than 12 months. Are you clear friends now about this? Oh, this is briefly about the classification of assets. Right? Uh, balance sheet we have defined. Then classification of assets, non-current assets, three items. And again, current assets, three items. And small description of one-one sentence for each. Now we will go to the classification of liabilities. Here also again, current liabilities, non-current liabilities. Right? Current liabilities. Just assets have a 12-month rule. Liabilities also have the same rule. If the business has to pay the money out in less than 12 months, it is called current liability. If it is more than 12 months, it is called non-current liability. Friends, very easy. All of you have followed. Within 12 months, you have to pay back the liability. It is called current liability. If it can be paid more than 12 months, it is called non-current liability. Now, what are the uh, examples for? Hello, eight. Yeah, okay. Okay, no? body pains or what? Massage is not available here. <laughs> <laughs> you have to go only what to spa is the famous here. Uh, so where I am a permanent member, I get some discounts. If you want, I'll give the coupon. <laughs> yeah, he is doing like this. He is talking to his brother. Brother, he is aching. So, eight I got because money is contained that eight. T-shirt. T-shirt eight. Uh, I have three. Right. Okay? Now for the current liabilities examples. Bank over draft. All of us are familiar, right? Uh, this is a current liability as it may have to be paid within 12 months. Banks generally have the right to call in an overdraft at 24 hours notice. Number two, trade credit hours. Most businesses also have trade credit hours on their balance sheet as a current liability. These arise when the business has bought goods or services from a supplier but has yet to pay the supplier's invoice. Any confusion? Any explanation required? Right. <laughs> yeah, happy no? Only two items are there. <laughs> yeah. Current liabilities, bank over debt, trade credit hours. Now non-current liabilities. This is any amount would that must be paid back, but not within 12 months. Non-current liabilities. You can change it, uh, paid back more than 12 months. Yeah, not within 12 months, you can write more than 12 months. Common examples of non-current liabilities include bank loans, mortgages, bond issues. All of you know bond. 
right? 7.5% bond, RBI. So 7.5% you get the yield, corporate banks, right? So there are three items here, bank loans, mortgages, bond issues. So we'll stop here, right? That's over. That's all, right? So what is a balance sheet? I'll briefly explain what are the classification of assets and liabilities with examples. Okay, this is the question. That is what you owe to the company. Is that clear now about this? Yes. So otherwise the formula can be rewritten like this. Equity is equal to assets minus liabilities. Equity is the property of the shareholders. Here is an example. Equity is equal to assets minus liabilities. I go in pounds. You can write with rupees. One or two, not the entire thing you will. You can just give. You have started the business with 2000 rupees. Just an example. So what will happen? What is the equity you are having? What are the assets you are having? You have not started any year. You have brought 2000 rupees and kept in the bank. So that is the equity amount and that is the cash you are having. What is your liability? No liability. Hello, why? Hello, madam. You are killing me. No, no. Uh, they look, you know, they <laughs> See, I started a business with uh, one core capital. Today, what is my equity? Because I only started as a shareholder. One crore is the equity. What is the amount I am having? One crore. Is there any liability for me? No. That is the first equation. Afterwards, I purchase or I spend, and the equation will change. Now, after the tools are brought, he has brought the tools worth of 500. So, in the beginning, equity was 2000. Now, he has purchased 500 tools. And what is the cash available? What is the liability? Zero. Zero. After some time, what he says, and he brought assets on credit. In the equity, it is 2000. Already he purchased tools for 500. Now he has bought assets for 750 and plus 1500 cash. Now what is the liability? 750. So now equity must be equal to assets minus liabilities. Tools you have purchased, it is an asset. And 1500 cash you are having, it is also an asset. Liquid asset we call it. But 750 assets you have purchased, but you have purchased on credit. So it is a liability. Huh? All of you have followed, no? Yes. So after some time, the company's first job, right? 2000 plus 50 rupees profit they got. So your capital is increased now. So 2000 plus 50, it is 2050. Now this side, 500, and you have got cash now. 50 rupees increased, 1550, 750, and liabilities is 750. So the final equation following these transactions continue to balance is equity 2050 is equal to assets 2800 minus liability 750, 2050. I think uh, all of you have followed this. Right? One thing is, it's the pounds you write rupees. It is just an example, right? Now, this is very, very, very important when you talk about the balance sheet. Balance sheet contains assets and liabilities, is it not? Like, the financial strength of the company shows the health of the company, right? What is a balance sheet? And explain in detail classification of assets and liabilities contained in the balance sheet. Uh, this is a very probable uh, no, question uh, we told they asked. What is a balance sheet? What are the classifying assets and classifying
testing liabilities that are shown in the balance sheet. What is a balance sheet? Already we have seen. A balance sheet is a statement of the net wealth of the business at a particular time. This is the definition for balance sheet. Friends, you just see this sentence. The difference between a business total assets and its total liabilities is called shareholders equity and it belongs to owners of the business. Agreed or not? Which is otherwise called equity. Okay? Now we will go to the different assets and liabilities. So always assets will be non-current assets, current assets. Liabilities will be current liabilities, non-current liabilities. What all the items fall under these four headings? That is what is called classification of assets and classification of liabilities. Very very important even for the exam itself. Assets are normally classified into non-current assets and current assets. Non-current assets are the items that are controlled by the business which the company intends to keep for more than one year. Not current, no urgency. It can be kept for quite some time. Generally more than a year. Current assets means within one year you have to replenish. Major categories of non-current assets include goodwill and other intangible assets, property and investments. Uh, you have to study and buy hard this. Right? Classifying assets, non-current assets, current assets. What do you mean by non-current assets? Assets which are kept for more than one year. What are the examples? These three are the examples. Be very clear. Goodwill, property and investments. Goodwill and other intangible assets. Goodwill is the difference between the amount paid for acquiring business and the value of the net assets of that business when acquired. Other intangible assets include patents, brands and licenses. Property. This includes freehold and leasehold property and land used QA, the business for trading. Investments. Investments includes property held for investments rather than used by the business for trading, equities and government bonds, corporate bonds. So there is a brief explanation of this non-current assets. But you should remember what are the non-current assets. Goodwill and other intangible assets, property and investments. Now we go to the current assets. Non-current assets must be for more than one year. Current assets must be within next 12 months. More than 12 months, non-current assets. Current assets within 12 months. These are the items of wealth that the business controls and intends to use within next 12 months. No, indirectly current assets mean which are more liquid assets which are known liquid assets. Within 12 months he is telling me, urgently when you need funds, what should be the assets? They are called current assets. So the best liquid asset is cash. Right now, next cash in bank. Or cash in a person or the bank or equivalent to that. Suppose you have got gold leverage also. You can sell it very easily. That also can be you know, liquid in cash. So what are the examples of current assets? Cash and cash equivalence. You see the wording. Cash and cash equivalence. Two, stock. Stock comprises of how many items? Hello, hello, hello. Three, who said? Great, three items. <laughs> Debtors. These are all the three items included in the current assets.
if you need any funds within 12 months, you look at these three items. Debtors, you have already given the money. Hello, hello, hello. You have to keep pay me within 12 months. You cannot have more. Now, brief description about this non-current asset. Cash and cash equivalents. This is cash on hand and cash held in the business's bank account, including deposits held for up to three months from the balance sheet date. Be very clear about this. Cash on hand, cash in bank. If you have got a deposit, it, it can be realized within three months. That means you can take deposits, you can, but for short duration, not for five years. Right? Number two, stock. In most cases, there are three different types of stock owned businesses. The first is raw materials, next is work in progress, and the third is finally the raw finished goods. These are the three components which we call stock. Debtors. Debtors are customers who owe business money. They are created when goods or services are sold on credit. Debtors are considered to be an item of wealth on the balance sheet since the customer is expected to pay within a short period of less than 12 months. Are you clear friends now about this? Oh, this is briefly about the classification of assets. Right? Uh, balance sheet we have defined. Then classification of assets, non-current assets, three items. And again current assets, three items. And small description of one one sentence for each. Now we will go to the classification of liabilities. Here also again current liabilities, non-current liabilities, right? Current liabilities, just assets have a 12 month rule, liabilities also have the same rule. If the business has to pay the money out in less than 12 months, it is called current liability. If it is more than 12 months, it is called non-current liability. Friends, very easy. All of you have followed. Within 12 months, you have to pay back the liability. It is called current liability. If it can be paid more than 12 months, it is called non-current liability. Now, what are the uh, examples for? Hello, eight. Yeah, okay. Okay, no? body pains or what? Massage is not available here. <laughs> You have to go only what to spa is the famous here. Uh, so where I am a permanent member, I get some discounts. If you want, I'll give the coupon. Yeah, he's doing like this. He's talking to his brother. Brother, he's aching. So, like eight I got because money in contain the eight. T-shirt, T-shirt eight. Uh, I have three. Okay. Now for the current liabilities examples, bank overdraft, all of us are familiar, right? Uh, this is a current liability as it may have to be paid within 12 months. Banks generally have the right to call in an overdraft at 24 hours notice. Number two, trade creditors. Most businesses also have trade creditors on their balance sheet as a current liability. These arise when the business has bought goods or services from a supplier but has yet to pay the supplier's invoice. Any confusion? Any explanation required? Right. We are happy now. Only two items are there. <laughs> current liabilities, bank over debt, trade creditors. Now non-current liabilities. This is any amount that must be paid back, but not within 12 months. Non-current liabilities. You can change it, uh, paid back more than 12 months. Yeah? Not within 12 months, you can write more than 12 months. Common examples of non-current liabilities include bank loans, mortgages, bond issues. All of you know bond. 7.5% bond, RBI. So 7.5% you get the yield, corporate banks, right? So there are three items here, bank loans, mortgages, bond issues. So 
we'll, we'll stop here, then. That's over. That's all, right? So what is a balance sheet? I'll briefly explain what are the classification of assets and liabilities with examples.